Okay, let's begin now. Good afternoon to everyone here in Hong Kong and buenos dias to those joining in Spain. Welcome to this joint webinar of the Madrid Bar Association and the Law Society of Hong Kong. Our topic today is doing business in Hong Kong and Spain. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping points for you. In this webinar, you are automatically muted are in listening mode only. Simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish is available for this webinar. So please select the audio channel to hear your language of choice. The chat room allows you to send messages to the host, panelists, and other attendees. And so if you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to type your question in the Q&A box during or after our presentations. We will then take your questions at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Maria to kick start our welcoming remarks. Maria, thank you. Welcome everybody uh, and thank you all for joining this um, webinar, doing business uh, between uh, Hong Kong and Spain, uh, co-organized between the Law Society of Hong Kong and uh, the Madrid Bar Association. I am Maria Segimon. I am a board member of the Madrid Bar Association, head of international affairs, and I am honored to welcome you to what I believe will be an extraordinary opportunity to get to know a little more about our two uh, uh, countries and about uh, our two jurisdictions and facilitate contacts among law practitioners in both jurisdictions. This webinar will be organized in two panels after the president of the Law Society of Hong Kong and the president of the Madrid Bar Association have had the floor. One will be the Spanish perspective and will be uh, in which uh, Borja, Mr. Borja Díaz Guerra, corporate and MA partner in Ecija, lawyer and solicitor and general secretary of the National Representative of the European Lawyer Association, will participate. And also Mr. Juan Martin Perroto, partner of the Madrid office of Uria and Menendez and head of the Asia practice of the firm. Um, therefore, and with no more delay, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the president of the Law Society of the Hong Kong Bar Association, Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan, please. Thank you, Maria. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jose Maria Alonso Puig, Dean of Madrid Bar Association, distinguished speakers, Members of the Law Society of Hong Kong and Madrid Bar Association, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're from. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar jointly organized by the Law Society of Hong Kong and the Madrid Bar Association. Facilitating new business opportunities for members is one of the Law Society of Hong Kong's important roles. Through the years, we have established extensive connections with lawyers associations and legal associations in different overseas jurisdictions, laying a good foundation for collaboration on activities that are beneficial to the respective members and legal professions. We have been working closely with the Madrid Bar Association on several occasions to advance the legal profession in both jurisdictions. To formalize our commitments to collaborate and support each other, a memorandum of understanding was signed in April 2016. There is no doubt that we will continue our effort in exploring ways to foster collaboration and to strengthen our members' exchanges. The uninvited visit of COVID-19 has brought international travel to a, almost a complete halt and stopped all physical business activities, meetings and seminars. Fortunately, technology has allowed us to remain connected unhindered by geographic separation by co-organizing this webinar. It is very encouraging to know that over 140 members are joining us today to learn more about doing business in Hong Kong and Spain. Before inviting our distinguished speakers to talk about how to set up business in Hong Kong and Spain, 
and highlights the respective market advantages, allow me to briefly introduce the bilateral trading relationship between Hong Kong and Spain, Hong Kong's business environment and legal system. I was just you know, checking on the website, uh, but there are still direct flights between Madrid and, and Hong Kong, so you can still do the traveling. So Spain is a close trading and investment partner of Hong Kong. Uh, on the trade front, uh, Spain was Hong Kong's sixth largest trading partner, fifth largest export market, and the seventh largest import market in the EU in 2020. As for bilateral investment, Hong Kong was the third largest destination in Asia for Spanish investors in 2019. For the same year, Hong Kong investors also made substantial investment in Spain, with the city ranked the fourth largest Asian investor in the country. As a leading international financial center, Hong Kong is one of the world's best place to do business. Uh, Hong Kong's free trade policy and easy customs procedures make it easier for businesses and companies to operate. Businesses and individuals in Hong Kong can also enjoy one of the most tax-friendly systems in the world, famous for its low tax regime. For instance, in the Economic Freedom of the World 2021 Annual Report of the Fraser Institute, Hong Kong was the world's freest economy since 1996. Among the five areas of assessment, Hong Kong continued to rank top in freedom to trade internationally and regulation. Hong Kong has a well-established legal system firmly based on the rule of law and an independent judiciary. Under the principle of one country, two systems, on the one hand, Hong Kong is part of China. On the other hand, Hong Kong is a special administrative region with our own economic system and way of life remain unchanged for 50 years after the handover, i.e. 2047. Hong Kong's legal system is based on the common law as entrenched in the basic law, which is our constitutional document. Being the only common law jurisdiction within China, the tried and trusted legal system of Hong Kong is always a cornerstone of our success. Hong Kong's open door policy has successfully attracted legal talent from around the world, enriching the diversity of Hong Kong's legal services market. As of the end of February, there were around 11,000 Hong Kong practicing solicitors and 941 local law firms, as well as around 1,500 foreign lawyers from 34 different overseas jurisdictions and 83 law, uh, foreign law firms in Hong Kong. There was, in fact, uh, one Spanish law firm registered as a foreign law firm in Hong Kong uh, in the past in, a few years ago. English and Chinese are both official languages and are commonly used in business. What's more, Hong Kong is a neutral dispute resolution venue with world-class arbitration and mediation institutions, such as the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, International Commercial Cham Chamber of Commerce, and CTEC, the Chinese uh, 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 Arbitration Center, and uh, with professionals uh, that are capable of providing efficient and reliable dispute resolution services. Robust legal infrastructure and financial system, a business-friendly environment, abundance of multi-net jurisdictional legal talents, as well as close connection and cooperation with mainland China, provide the necessary high-end professional service support to, to foreign investors. These unique characteristics have enabled Hong Kong to build up its global reputation as a leading financial and business hub. So to conclude, uh, I hope you will find uh, our joint webinar to be an informative and rewarding experience and would be interested in setting up your business in Hong Kong or to expand your business into Asia and China via Hong Kong. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Chen. It was very interesting uh, and very encouraging for both jurisdictions. Now I'm really honored to give the floor to my president, Mr. Jose Maria Alonso, president of the Madrid Bar Association. Jose Maria, please. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good morning, everyone from Spain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chan, for your words. 
Uh, it's a real pleasure for the Madrid Bar Association to organize this uh, virtual event together with the Law Society of uh, Hong Kong. And for me as uh, president of the Madrid Bar Association, which is the largest bar association in, in Europe with more than 76,000 uh, members, uh, it's an honor to, to inaugurate this event because it is an opportunity to uh, continue uh, strengthening uh, the relationships between these two institutions, the Law Society of uh, Hong Kong and the Madrid Bar Association, which, uh, which are without a doubt uh, two reference of the law professional in the respective regions. Uh, since the uh, signing of uh, the memorandum of understanding between the between the law society and the, the law society of Hong Kong and the Madrid uh, uh, Bar Association, to which uh, uh, Mr. Chan uh, has referred to, uh, these two institutions uh, have maintained uh, permanent and fluid communication channel uh, allowing both of us to have a more effect, efficient and uh, permanent collaboration. Uh, moreover, I would like to congratulate the, the uh, Law Society of Hong Kong for consistently organizing legal events that uh, have become land, landmarks forums for the bar associations and legal professionals all over the world. Events such as the President's Roundtable and the opening of the legal year are and will be in the long term mandatory dates in the Madrid uh, Bar's calendar. Uh, events uh, like this, one must only be uh, the starting point for colleagues to discuss practical matters, to seek solutions to common problems in relation to cross-border practices, exchange legal and business knowledge, in addition to being point of liaison with other jurisdictions where legal practitioners may wish to practice. Um, indeed, uh, due to, the, to this increasing competition in the legal sector, the uh, usefulness of these encounters between colleagues from different jurisdictions grows constantly. This fierce competition forces us to con constantly improve ourselves, to create uh, networks uh, quicker and find synergies that can take our daily practice to a different level. Besides, uh, today I would like to highlight that the two jurisdictions, Hong Kong and Spain, the city of Madrid in particular, have two common important characteristics. First, com companies constantly come from all continents to Hong Kong and Spain, and especially to Madrid, with the conviction that they will find world-class legal services highly qualified lawyers and expert judges in specialized courts, which are a warranty to promote commercial relationships and the creation of businesses. Both Hong Kong and, and Madrid are governing, governed by the rule of law. Second, both jurisdictions are ideal gateway to all the important markets. Hong Kong is a long-standing gateway to the rest of the Asian market, which as you will, all we, you will all know, is experiencing an incessant growth in the last few years. In the case of Spain, uh, our country has for many years served as the natural and perfect gateway for international lawyers and companies to enter the Latin American market. Countries with which we share legal tradition, language, uh, 
and most importantly, a natural and undeniable connection. Spain has a very strong strategic uh, location and deep trade partnerships with access to the markets of the EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. Additionally, Spain, as you will know, is an important member of the European Union, which also grants direct and privileged access to the world's largest common market, one with 500 million people. In the same line uh, with the prior, it is important to note that the investments between the two jurisdictions, as Mr. Chang has highlighted, Hong Kong and Spain have been increasing substantially in the last decade, tendency that it is expected to continue in the years to come. Also, as Hong Kong with the uh, uh, arbitration court in Hong Kong, Madrid has created the uh, Madrid Jurisdictional uh, uh, International Arbitration Center, just to be a point of connection of all the uh, speaking countries uh, in the world. Uh, today, more than 600 people uh, speak uh, Spanish across the world, which is something extremely important. And this center uh, tends to be, I mean, uh, the, the, the reference of uh, arbitration in international uh, cases. Um, today, uh, we have the opportunity to learn from distinguished speakers with a very solid background in corporate and international law, how in practice, businesses should be done in Hong Kong uh, and Spain. So thanks again, thanks to those that have made possible to uh, organizing this, uh, this important event. You can be sure Mr. Chan that we'll, we will be, I mean, uh, totally committed to a strengthening our relationship between the two the two I mean, uh, legal bodies. Uh, we, we think Hong Kong is very, very important to, for Spain. And, and we will, as I say, try to be permanently in contact and, and try to do things in common. Uh, and uh, I will uh, probably ask you to, to join when we do something with Latin America, because I think it is very important, this connection between Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President. Um, uh, thank you both. Uh, now, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the moderator of these uh, two panels. Sorry, I, I didn't say that the second panel will be, um, will be participated by Mr. Neville Cheng, member of the International League of Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong, and, Mr. and Ms. Heidi Chui, member of the International Legal Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong. And now um, I have the pleasure of introducing you uh, to Alison Tsoi. Um, she will be um, the moderator of both panels. Uh, she has been serving as a member of the International League of Affairs Committee and a member of the In-House Lawyers Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong, uh, and is currently the legal counsel at Kerry Holdings Limited, the investment holding company of Quok Group, which is a multinational conglomerate. She's primarily responsible for advising on the legal and re regulatory affairs of the investment financing and corporate work of Kerry Holdings Limited and its affiliates entities. Thank you very much, Alison, for taking the floor now and moderating the, the, both panels uh, for, for, both, for both for all participants. Thanks very much. Thank you, Maria, for introducing me. And thanks very much to CM and Jose Maria for the welcome remarks. Um, we'll now first have a presentation on behalf of the Madrid Bar Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers, Boha and Juan Martin, 
Boha is a partner of the corporate and M&A practice at Athiha and the general secretary and national representative of the European Law Lawyers Association. In addition to being a lawyer in Spain, Boha is also admitted as solicitor of England and Wales. He has more than 15 years of experience in commercial and corporate advisory matters, with special focus on corporate transactions, investment and divestment processes in different jurisdictions, and corporate restructurings. Juan Martin is a corporate partner at Uria Menendez. Juan Martin spent his career living and practicing law in Latin America, Europe, and Asia, where he lived in Beijing for five years. He is part of the Asia Group and of the Latin America Group of his firm, Uria. He is a member of the UN Expert Group of Good Practices in Infrastructure Development and an arbitrator for CTAC and several other arbitration panels in Asia. Juan Martin's focus of expertise is M&A and infrastructure work. So may I now hand over to Boha and Juan Martin, please. Thank you. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Boha, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Alison, for your warm welcome. Also to Maria Sehiman, um, President Mr. Chan, uh, President uh, uh, Jose Maria Alonso, distinguished um, attendees, panelists, moderator, and also interpreters. Um, good morning to all, to everyone in Spain, and also good afternoon to everyone in, in Hong Kong. Let me share with you uh, a brief presentation. Let me upload it. Here we go. So I would like to provide you a brief overview of how to, how to set up a business in Spain, how are the typical structures we use or the foreigners or foreign investors use in Spain. We will also, I will also provide you a, a brief walk um, to a description of the, of the Spanish limited companies, the different types, the two main types of uh, limited liability companies we have. Um, we will end up with, a, with a, a brief overview also about the main aspects of corporate governance in the Spanish limited companies. So um, these are perhaps the most common uh, structures or, uh, that are used by foreign investors um, or uh, for investments in Spain. Um, this, uh, the first ones would be, which perhaps is the most common one, would be to use a limited company. Uh, here in Spain, we have two main types of limited, uh, uh, limited companies, which are the public limited companies, uh, which are called Sociedades Anonymas or, or the so-called uh, essays and also we have uh, limited liability companies uh, which are the sociedades de responsabilidad limitadas or, or the so-called sl obviously this these types of companies uh, enjoy the limited a limited liability regime uh, they have legal personality uh, uh, they they can have uh, they can uh, obtain the tax identification number to get registered at the social security uh, hire employees and in general terms to to carry out business here in Spain. Uh, I will further develop uh, the two main types of, of uh, limited companies in the, in the next point. Um, you can also have, uh, perhaps the order is not correct, but uh, you can also have uh, uh, another structure which is called branch, uh, which is uh, in Spanish is sucursal. Uh, this uh, is also a typical structure for foreign investors uh, or foreign companies. Uh, investing in Spain, uh, perhaps the main the main difference uh, with the with the limited liability companies or limited companies is that it, it doesn't have uh, a legal personality, but it is kind of extension an extension uh, of of the parent company of the foreign company establishing the branch uh, in Spain. Um, branches are uh, for the establishment of branches here in Spain. Uh, you need to. Um, to, to do it through the execution of the corresponding public deed. And also they need to get registered at the commercial registry. Um, 
a branch uh, can obtain a, a tax identification number and also to get uh, registered at the social security and to hire employees. So uh, it is it is quite common to have uh, to have branches uh, for foreign groups. Um, and then there would be another possibility, which perhaps is the lighter the lightest structure you may have in Spain. Uh, uh, which could be the, um, the representative offices. Uh, these this, uh, structures are very light, uh, uh, um, particularly or normally addressed for ancillary or instrumental activities. Uh, it is quite straightforward, the process for establishing a representative offices, uh, office. You just need to, to incorporate the, or to establish the, the rep office through uh, uh, the execution of a public deed. Uh, and, it wouldn't be subject to registration at the commercial registry. Um, despite of not being um, subject to registration, uh, it, it is able to, to get a, a, a tax identification number, to get also registered at the social security and to have, uh, to, have em to hire employees. Um, and then uh, perhaps uh, it is also common uh, uh, to have commercial joint ventures or equity joint ventures. Commercial joint ventures at the end of the day is um, uh, two companies, two or more companies uh, 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 normally participated by foreign, uh, foreign companies, uh, which are, uh, doesn't have a, a formal structure like the other ones, like uh, public uh, limited companies or limited liability companies, but the, the structure is made um, um, through a contract contractual relationship and equity joint ventures equity joint ventures at the end of the day is uh, uh, it's uh, normally uh, one limited liability company or public limited company which is participated by two or more uh, investors or shareholders uh, and obviously or, or normally with uh, with uh, with a business a specific business purpose uh, purpose uh, to carry out business here in Spain so we move to the second point. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the, 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 um, the structure normally used, or which is quite common to be used uh, by foreign investors, uh, could be to have uh, uh, limited companies. The main two types uh, of limited companies in Spain are the public limited companies, SAs, and the SLs, uh, the limited liability companies. Both types of businesses or, or companies are regulated in the same law in the uh, in the Spanish Companies Act. Uh, um, both companies, both types of companies, share the same some 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 common provisions, uh, but there are some differences between them. So perhaps uh, these ones are the most general ones. There are other ones, but to give you an overview, um, the minimum share capital of uh, an SA could be 60,000 euros uh, uh, and for an SL would be 3,000 euros. Uh, the shares in an SA are uh, called or are considered as securities uh, or book entries uh, in SLs are, are not considered securities. In terms of uh, the transfer of shares, the, the SAs are, are more open companies. So the restrictions on the transfer of shares are are, are less restrictive. Um, and in comparison to that, uh, limited liability companies are closer. Uh, uh, the restrictions on the transfer of shares are, are more restricted uh, by default. Obviously, this can, these two things, um, or these, uh, the transfer of share regimes, uh, and in the, same, in, the same way, in the same way that happened with other, um, with other uh, elements of, two, of the two companies, can be slightly modified uh, uh, in the corporate bylaws and also through the um, through the uh, a proper or the corresponding shareholders agreement. Um, the independent report that's another point, which is uh, uh, there is a difference here between both companies for contributions uh, of non-monetary contributions in, uh, in share capital uh, for the SAs. Uh, you could need uh, an independent report. And um, for uh, SLs, it is not man non mandatory. Sometimes recommended, but non mandatory. And um, well, the, the, obviously, uh, the common 
element for both of them is that the, one of the or the main common element for both of them is that the limited uh, uh, there is a limitation the liability to the capital contributed by by the shareholders. So uh, um, I wanted also to to provide you uh, a tentative incorporation timeline. Obviously, this this uh, this uh, applies on a case by case basis depending on the jurisdiction involved of the of the uh, investing company. Uh, but uh, perhaps the, this could be the average, um, and three weeks, I'm not sure if you can read this, uh, 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 but three weeks uh, until uh, the company has legal personality and another three weeks for uh, um, certain um, post formalities uh, that will need to be carried out here in Spain. Just to provide you a brief summary, um, um, I believe Hong Kong is part of the Hague Convention, so which uh, is very useful for when it comes to foreign investors, uh, because with the apostille you can uh, you can uh, prove uh, proof authenticity of the of the documents granted abroad. Uh, so to have um, to have validity here in Spain, uh, as in other as in the other countries forming part of of this uh, convention. So. Um, we would need here to have a, a power of attorney uh, for the incorporation of a company of the company and also um, to um, uh, obtain the uh, tax identification number of the uh, foreign company. Uh, this is this is uh, this is required that the foreign company obtain a tax identification and a Spanish tax identification number uh, for the incorporation. And also for the uh, for the uh, NIE number, it, it is called NIE number here in Spain. is uh, is the foreign identification number of the future directors of the company, as long as such directors are are non-resident uh, here in Spain. With um, uh, also there will be a need to uh, to reserve the corporate name of the company, which is very straightforward. To open the bank account uh, for the opening of the, of the bank account. Um, there could be it would be needed to to contribute the share capital of, of, of the company um, and with that and also with the bylaws which will regulate the the, um, the relationship uh, between the shareholders uh, 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 the incorporation public deed that the Spanish notary could be could be executed from this point from the execution of the public uh, incorporation public deed uh, and such company would have uh, legal personality okay um uh, however uh, there are some post formalities also apply uh, for example that the new company would need to obtain a tax identification number uh, and also to be filed and registered at the commercial registry so um the third point uh, would be perhaps this 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 point uh, it is uh, um, makes more sense when uh, foreign investors are entering into the market uh, in a company uh, having a minority or majority stake. Uh, if you, if the foreign investors are are entering into the Spanish market uh, with a sole shareholder company, meaning 100% of the company having 100% of the company, uh, this could be of uh, second priority. However, when it comes to investments, uh, uh, joint investments. Uh, uh, with other shareholders, this this could be this could be important. Um, the main two bodies in in the uh, limited companies are uh, the shareholders meeting and the governing body. The shareholders meeting uh, will deal mainly deal with the structural things uh, of the company, with the modification of the bylaws, uh, the approval of the accounts, the appointment of auditors, the appointment also the directors and the decision of the type of governing body. Uh, and so on. Um, and the governing body, uh, which would be in a way below the shareholders meeting, uh, would be in charge of the day-to-day -day business affairs of the company. When it comes to shareholders' rights, uh, the main ones, uh, there are many, but the main ones could be that the shareholders could be the right to, to, uh, to the allocation of benefits or profits uh, and the uh, liquidation quota in case of liquidation uh, of the company, preemptive rights for new shares in, in increase of capital. Um, this is not absolute. There are some exceptions uh, sometimes, 
but in general terms, uh, there, there are preemptive rights uh, for all the shareholders. Um, the right to vote in the general shareholders meeting, the right to challenge corporate resolutions, which perhaps were not properly adopted, uh, and the right uh, of information, information rights. Um, uh, and about the governing body, different types of governing body. As I mentioned before, the governing body will be in charge of, uh, will deal with the day-to-day -day business affairs of the company, with the management of the of the company. You can, uh, okay, you can you can have different types of governing bodies. Uh, you can have a sole director. Uh, you can have a uh, joint and several directors, uh, which means uh, that uh, all of, uh, each of them, each of such directors can represent uh, the company uh, with their own signature. Uh, you can have joint directors, meaning that all these joint directors uh, have uh, jointly, uh, for the representation of the company, all these uh, directors need to act jointly. And you can have also a board of directors. Uh, that's that's uh, another, there's another difference between uh, cells and essays uh, when it comes to board of directors. Uh, board of directors needs to have at least three members uh, and for cells up to 12 members. Uh, in essays, there's no limit um, on this. So um, just, uh, uh, just for your visibility in the Spanish market, uh, as I mentioned before, the main structure normally uh, is uh, to have uh, uh, limited companies, uh, perhaps uh, despite there are some other structures, uh, like I mentioned before, branches uh, and also rep offices. Um, the, the decision on that, uh, because of all, all, the, all the presentation, uh, it's addressed from a corporate perspective, but please take into account that the decision for that going to one structure or the other has to be properly assessed um, from also from a tax perspective, just to assess any kind of uh, tax impact that this, uh, that this structure may have on the parent company or uh, on the future business to be developed. Um, uh, and perhaps between all these structures uh, uh, I mentioned, um, perhaps the most common one uh, would be the limited liability companies, uh, the SL. Um, I believe the, more than 90% 90, 90 of the companies in, in the market are, in the Spanish market, are SLs. And the reason probably is because of the flexibility and also because uh, it, it is cheaper in a way to incorporate uh, and, and easy, uh, easier to manage. So, um i'm i'm not sure if uh obviously there are some there are this some uh space now at the end of the meeting for a q a uh, so in case you would like to uh, get deeply in one of these points uh, we can we can uh, talk about them later on uh, on the q and a i hope uh, you enjoyed the, the the presentation and overview um thanks to all uh, particularly to the interpreter. Uh, hopefully, uh, she has not suffered too much my speech. Um, so I give the floor to Alison again. Thank you very much, Baha. Um, so may I now hand over to Juan Martin, who will continue the presentation and tell us more about the um, Spanish environment and how to do business in Spain. Juan Martin. Thanks, Alison. Uh, thanks for inviting me and Jose Maria, and Mr. Chan, for organizing this. I'm not sure if my screen is being shared. Yes, it is. It is on the. It is on the screen. Okay. Um, thank you. So I mean, just the. Uh, I mean, after what. Borja described it, one just to give you a 10,000 feet uh, overview of, of investing in Spain, mostly from a regulatory perspective and in three areas, which would be a direct investment, a joint venture, or uh, a greenfield uh, project. 
Um, just a few words. I mean, I, as a foreign practitioner, I, I have I have practiced law in Latin America, Alison and, and, and China, and in Europe for several years where I have lived. But if if you uh, give any credit to my word, I can tell that as a foreign practitioner, I found Spain to be in the in the extreme of of openness, and this is what statistics says and rank that ranks Spain as the 10 most open country to FDI. So our Hong Kong colleagues will identify with that because Hong Kong is mostly the same. And that has reflected in, in inflows. Uh, Spain is a net uh, inf inflow destination for investment and ranks 11th in the world. But what is more interesting is that, and this is, has been the case for with Chinese investments, it's also uh, the, a large, one of the main leading uh, uh, destinations for greenfield uh, projects, uh, number five in, in the world, in spite of some, a few things or, or setbacks that I will describe. In terms of investing, uh, directly in Spain, not greenfield projects, but acquiring a company. Uh, two things are important if you are, are, and may explain the attractiveness of Spain as a destination for foreign direct investments. The first one is if you acquire a, 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 a company through an SPA, a share purchase agreement, you expect that the contract is complied with. And, and in that regard, Spain, in terms of enforcement of contracts, uh, 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 presents a, a, a fairly uh, welcoming uh, system. And basically, this is an a, 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 a overview, word overview to which our firm contributes. Uh, it's a case study and with the same type of claim, same amount and, and same characteristics and fe features. To, to enforce a claim in Spain, uh, you, you will spend a certain amount of days and money. In terms of how quickly our courts react, uh, Spain ranks below uh, Hong Kong. You will, you will get an enforcement of, 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 that, uh, award, of that court decision in roughly one and a half years in, in, in Hong Kong is less, but still, yeah, the good news is that litigating in Spain is much more cheaper than in Hong Kong. Uh, overall, to other peers in Europe, uh, Southern European countries, as you will see in the left common uh, column, uh, Spain ranks uh, fairly high. If instead you partner with another person in a joint venture, as Borja explained, uh, uh, Spain also offers a great deal of protection in terms of minority rights and, and, and court protection for, for minorities. Again, uh, well ahead of other European peers. And, and, and this is an, an area that is uh, uh, subject to common rules in, in under European law, under the uh, second directive of uh, corporate uh, governance, etc. But but still, uh, Spain on this, you will not find any unpleasant surprises. Where you may find unpleasant surprises is in greenfield projects where permits are important. And here, unfortunately, Spain has to, a lot of work to do. Uh, Spain is a very decentralized uh, country, unlike Hong Kong. We have three levels of government, government municipalities, regional government, state government, and all claim a permit. Uh, a, a client of ours in, in, in to build a port uh, has had to go through 180 permits, and that is something that is is not acceptable, and and we need to to change. Uh, in spite of that, as I said before, Spain has not. Uh, I mean, this this feature has not shied away uh, international investors, and Spain still is. Uh, uh, one of the leading destinations from Greenfield, Greenfield projects. 
And that and that's again has to do both direct investments and, and greenfield projects with, with three basic features that were mentioned before. One is uh, in general, you don't need authorizations to invest. You don't, there are no capital restrictions as you will find in, in China or in some other uh, Latin American countries. And uh, the 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 in tax wise is uh, 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 Spain has, as Jose Maria mentioned, uh, a wide network of treaties, including one with Hong Kong, under which dividends, for example, are generally not subject to any withholding or dividends and capital gains. Um, so, uh, on that regard, that that is uh, uh, certainly a feature that attracts. Uh, uh, foreign investment. Um, there is, however, and this is recent, and, and what I'm going to say now is uh, enshrined in a regulation. That, so this is the same for all European jurisdictions. Um, there is a FDI clearance. You need, uh, uh, depending on, on the target uh, uh, company you are acquiring or investing in or the type of investor you are, you may need an authorization when you are a non-European investor or a company which ultimate beneficiary owner is a non-European investor. Uh, when you acquire more than 10% in a company to the extent that company is engaged in certain sectors, or you are a certain type of investor, you will need to get an approval from the national authority, in this case, the Spanish uh, uh, Council of Ministers. Um, the type of industries or sectors where you will need an authorization are the typical ones, critical infrastructure and technologies, critical inputs as energy or raw materials, media. And one that is very fashionable nowadays, which is those sectors with access to sensitive information, including personal data. This is the new economy. And wherever uh, data is managed as a, as a, as a, as a, a, a massive scale, you will need uh, to get an authorization to buy that uh, company. Irrespective of the sectors, uh, those uh, investors that have been uh, uh, punished for illegal activities or have invested in, a, in, a, in critical sectors in other countries, we need also an authorization, again, in respect of the sector. And what is relevant perhaps to you, uh, particularly for, for mainland Chinese uh, investors, is that authorizations will always be needed when the, uh, when the investor is, is controlled by uh, a government, an SOE or a, a sovereign wealth fund. Other than that, there are obviously a number of uh, authorizations that are required in certain sectors, irrespective if you are a foreign or local investor. But these, again, are the typical ones, power and gas. If you want to, to, come to buy a, 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 a company that is engaged in a transport, storage, generation of power, or uh, distribution or transmission of power on, 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 or gas, uh, you will need uh, an authorization when, and this is a soft test, whenever uh, the, uh, it might affect the, the security or supply or, of gas or power. And this is a, a soft test, it's not written on the wall. You have to analyze that with your, with your lawyers, obviously a small, power generation company will not raise these concerns, other might raise. Uh, financial and insurance entities, as in Hong Kong, you will need to provide notice if you acquire 5% uh, stake in a bank or an approval if you go over 10. Uh, for infrastructure concessions as well, if you acquire control, and then there are limitations for, for flag carriers that cannot keep the slots. If you acquire, a, if a foreigner acquires a, a national carrier and uh, well, uh, the other limitation in the power sector results from unbundling, uh, uh, 
uh, a same person cannot control uh, the production, generation, su uh, supply, and transport of, of, of power. So you, you will have to choose or otherwise st sterilize your shares and, 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 and don't have any, any vote. Um, what, what is interesting, I also think for Hong Kong practitioners is a project of uh, at the European level of uh, a regulation that uh, for MA acquisition, no? uh, for acquisition of, of, of European companies or to participate in public tenders, if the target company uh, uh, has a turnover uh, in the uh, EU in excess of high, uh, 500 million euros and the purchaser has received subsidies, public aid, and this includes uh, uh, public financing, public policy financing, for example, one granted by the Chinese Development Bank in excess of 50 million in the last three years, then you will have to go through a special screening similar to antitrust screening. And this is intended to protect, to avoid that subsidies interfere with, uh, has a distorted effect in the market. So the, this was raised by, by Chinese companies and, and, uh, controlled by the, by the government that uh, received the very, very cheap financing. And as a reaction uh, to that, uh, um, the authorities uh, enact, is, are in the process of enacting this regulation. This does not mean that they will not be approved, but that, they, that these investments will be scrutinized. Uh, lastly, and um, I finish with this, there are also, if you acquire a company in Europe and that company is listed, you have to keep an eye in regulations that are similar to the ones in Hong Kong. Uh, you will have to disclose whenever you acquire more than three or 5% or 1% if, if the investor is in a, in a, in a tax heaven uh, and any multiple of 5%. So whenever you acquire that level of stake, you will have to go public and disclose it to the market. And this might be uncomfortable in certain cases. Uh, if you go over 30%, you will have to launch a, a mandatory tender offer. Uh, uh, but again, that this is uh, uh, something that is probably uh, a, a feature that is, is common with, with Hong Kong and, and, and that not that many investments that result in, in this. So, with this, I, I, I wrap up and I, I leave the floor again to Alison. Thank you. So next up, we will have a presentation on behalf of the Law Society of Hong Kong. As for our speakers, I'm delighted to introduce Neville and Heidi. They both serve in the International Legal Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong together with myself. Neville is a partner of Fong's, a Hong Kong law firm providing cross-border legal services with joint venture law offices, Zhongyin Law Firm of Mainland China and Rato Ling Li and Cortes of Macau. The firm is also in association with Spencer West LLP of the UK. Neville is the vice chairman of the Greater China Legal Affairs Committee and a member of the International Legal Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong. He is also a professional accountant and dedicates to provide corporate and commercial legal services to clients. Heidi is a partner of the Hong Kong law firm Stevenson Wong & Co. in association with the PRC law firm Albright Law Offices. She heads the banking and finance department and the dispute resolution department of her firm. Heidi is a member of the International Legal Affairs Committee, Greater China Legal Affairs Committee, Arbitration Committee, and InnoTech Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong. She advises clients on cross-border financing transactions and also international trade and investment disputes. So may I now hand over to Neville and Heidi. Thank you. Good afternoon to our Law Society members and good morning to those in Spain. I shall. Okay, let me start now. So Hong Kong maintains a free trade economic policy with its proximity to the market of mainland China. It has become one of the most attractive place for investment and is also one of the most favorable destination for multinational companies to set up their Asia Pacific headquarters. For businessmen, 
Their main concern may be business opportunities. The voice lawyers would be concerned more about the vehicle or entities that we may assist our client to set up for their business ventures. The most common type of business entity would be limited company, then partnership, and more directly as the sole proprietor. Hong Kong company, the most common type is company limited by shares. One may also incorporate an unlimited liability company, but it is quite unusual. If you want to set up a new company, you should have registered one at the Hong Kong Companies Registry, but you may also use an existing foreign company to set up a branch in Hong Kong to do the business here. If you do not want or are not allowed to use a corporation, you may carry on a business in partnership or doing it alone as a sole proprietor. The procedure for setting up a Hong Kong company is rather simple and may not and may be done through the internet. There is no minimum capital requirement. The share capital of a private company may be as little as one Hong Kong dollar or one euro. It may only have one shareholder. The shareholder may be a natural person or an other corporation without any nationality or residence requirement. He or she may be a Chinese, a Spanish, or an other company incorporated elsewhere in the world. If it is registered as a private company, the number of shareholders shall be limited to 50. If there is a plan to have it listed at any stock exchange, then it should be registered as a non-private company and be subject to more rules and regulations. So today I will mainly introduce the information about private company in Hong Kong. While shareholders are the investors, directors are the person in actual control of the operation and management of the company. The minimum number of director for a company is only one who must be a natural person. If a company has more than one director, the other directors may be companies incorporated in Hong Kong or elsewhere. For natural persons, the director must be aged 18 or above and not a bankrupt or under any disqualification order. Like shareholders, there's no residence or nationality requirements for a director. A director may operate and manage the business remotely from any place outside Hong Kong. There's no shareholding requirements for a director unless the bylaw or what we call the Articles of Association of the company, so required. A Hong Kong limited company must have at least one company secretary who should be a natural person ordinarily residing in Hong Kong or be another company having a place of business in Hong Kong. Many Hong Kong legal and accounting professionals would offer the services by providing a nominee company as the company secretary for fulfilling the legal requirement. Register office is the official address for accepting service of legal documents and keeping of statutory records, including books of accounts of the company and various registers of records, such as the register of, of directors and shareholders. Every Hong Kong company must have a register office in Hong Kong and it may not have to be its place of business. Again, many professional legal and accounting practitioners would provide register office service to let you register your company at their office. The name of the company must then be displayed at the entrance, but of course they will not allow you to operate your business at their office. But the law also required a significant controller register so as to identify the person in actual control of the company. The company shall identify a natural person in ultimate control directly or indirectly with not less than 25% of the shares or the voting rights in the company. If the one in ultimate control is a company listed, 
on any recognized stock exchange, that company shall be the significant controller. Now, every Hong Kong company shall hold a general meeting of shareholders every year for approving the annual auditor account of the company and for appointing the auditor for the next year. If the company has only one shareholder, such general meeting may be waived, or it may also be held in paper form by signing for approval by all shareholders in the place of an actual meeting. For private company, the financial records and accounts of the company are internal records. There is no filing or disclosure requirement, and the external third parties may not be able to access through any public channel. A company, if not established in Hong Kong, may also run a business by setting up a branch office in Hong Kong. When it has a place of business in Hong Kong, it shall register at the Hong Kong Companies Registry as a foreign company. It will be assigned a company number with the prefix of letter F. It must also appoint a natural person residing in Hong Kong as the authorized representative of the company with authority to accept service of legal documents. For partnership, we adopt the common law principle of partnership. The laws of Hong Kong requires some business must not be conducted by a limited company, such as lawyers. So we must practice in the form of partnership or doing it alone as a sole practitioner. Limited liability, liability partnership may also be set up in Hong Kong with at least one general partner bearing unlimited liability, where the other partner's liability may be limited. For lawyers practice, we may also have limited liability partnership. The limit on liability is not on monetary term, but on the area of practice that an individual partner is responsible for in the firm. If you want to run a personal business in Hong Kong, you may also run it as a sole proprietor. So another concern is about the visa. Although there is no residence requirement for being a shareholder or director of a Hong Kong company, if eventually a natural person has to come to Hong Kong to conduct business, a visa or permit to enter and stay in Hong Kong is still necessary. A person holding a Spanish passport may come and stay in Hong Kong as a tourist for a period of 90 days without a visa. Limited business activities without visa are allowed, such as for concluding contract, submitting tenders, participating in exhibitions, but must, with, must, must be without selling activities, and for attending short-term seminars and business meetings. One of a businessman's main concern is tax. The tax system in Hong Kong is simple and the tax rate is quite low. There are only three kinds of tax, namely profit tax, salary tax, and property tax, and an additional one, stamp duty. We adopt a territorial system of charging tax. We have no VAT, no withholding tax, and no tax on dividend paid by a limited company to its shareholders. The profit of a capital nature is tax-free. For example, if you buy a house in Hong Kong and let it out for inter rental income, it is therefore an investment asset. After several years, when the property market is good, the price inflated and you sell it out for a good profit, such profit is capital in nature and would be tax free. However, if you are a real estate developer or a trader, the land of properties in your hands would be your trading stock and the profit will be considered as trading income instead of capital revenue and be subject to tax. And for dividend, the principle is that the same income will not be taxed twice. Therefore, 
dividends distributed by a limited company to its shareholders would not be taxed while coming into the hands of the shareholders because it is the after-tax profit of the company and the company has already paid the tax on it. By applying the territorial source principle, a company or person shall only be liable to pay, pay tax if it carry on a trade profession or business in Hong Kong and it has accessible profit arising in or derived from Hong Kong. So a Hong Kong company, even if it has made a very substantial or large amount of profit, it still may not have to pay tax if in Hong Kong it either does not conduct any business activities here or the profit is not earned from any business activities in Hong Kong. But the tax rate is relatively very low. There's no business tax. Profit tax is only charged on net profit of the business annually. For company, the current rate of tax is 16.5%. And for individual, it's 15%. And maybe at a progressive rate for from 2 to 17% if finally a lower amount of tax is so charged. And here we now have a concession for the first 2 million Hong Kong dollar of profit the tax rate will be half. That is 8.25 for corporation and 7.5 for an individual. Although the territorial source principle appears very attractive to businessmen, there's a lot of criteria and rulings laid down by court cases that a taxpayer must fulfill before one may be entitled to the benefit. Firstly, it is the operation tax. Considerations include where the business is operated, where is the establishment for running the business, so where do the major business activities take place. Where the contract is concluded would be considered, but it is not a decisive factor. More weight would be put on the antecedent and incidental activities in relation to the performance of the contract place where the decision is made is crucial and whether the business has any establishment overseas for conducting the offshore business activities for earning such offshore profit is also an important factor. Territorial source principle also applies to salaries tax. An employee shall pay salaries tax on his salary income from a Hong Kong employee. Where it is a Hong Kong employment, consideration shall be paid firstly to where is the place of residence of the employer, then where the employment contract is negotiated and signed, and finally, where the salary is paid. If any of these three is in Hong Kong, the Indian Revenue will incline to consider it a Hong Kong employment. If the employment is not a Hong Kong employment, but the employee provide his service for the employment in Hong Kong, then such part of the income earned for services provided in Hong Kong will also be subject to Hong Kong tax, despite it is not a Hong Kong employment. However, if you stay in Hong Kong in total of not more than 60 days in a financial year, then any service provided in Hong Kong in such a year would not be taken into account for tax purpose. The financial year for Hong Kong is from the 1st of April to 31st of March of the next year. So if you stay in Hong Kong and work in Hong Kong for less than 60 days in the financial year, your salary income will not be subject to tax in Hong Kong. Even when you have a Hong Kong employment, if you can satisfy this 60 days rule, you will also be considered as providing all your services out of Hong Kong and be free from salary tax under the territorial source principle. We have property tax, which is tax on rental income from landed properties in Hong Kong. It applies only to property owners who is natural persons. If the landlord receiving the rent is a company, the landlord company will be considered as carrying on property leasing business and shall pay profit tax 
on such income instead of property tax. If it is a subleasing, the principal tenant further leases the property out to a subtenant, the principal tenant will be considered as carrying on a subleasing business, and then the income will again be subject to property tax instead of property tax. Stamp duty is a tax levy on sale or transfer of land and property in Hong Kong and shares in Hong Kong companies. They shall also be payable on tenancy or leasing agreements of land and properties. For sales or transfer of shares in Hong Kong companies, the rate of stamp duty is 0.26% of the transfer price or the net value of the shares, whichever the higher. There can be exemption if the transfer of shares are within the same group of companies or between companies under the same control. For rental or leasing agreement of land to properties, the rate of stamp duty is from 0.25% to 1% of the annual income or annual rental. Stamp duty is only payable on written documents of the relevant transaction. So if the agreement for the tenancy of the lease is a verbal one rather than in writing, no stamp duty shall be payable. However, such kind of benefit may only be enjoyed in transfer of shares or landed properties because law requires these two kinds of transactions must be done in writing. Stamp duty on transfer of landed properties in Hong Kong is at a progressive rate on the price ranging from a fixed sum of 100 Hong Kong dollar to 4.25% of transfer price or the market value, whichever the highest. Because the price of landed properties in Hong Kong has been driven very high in the recent years, the government introduced the policy that if you are not a permanent Hong Kong resident, or if you are, but you are already the owner of a residential property in Hong Kong, the progressive rate will be replaced by a fixed rate of 15% of the price or the market value. So it's a rather high one. Hong Kong has also signed a number of double taxation relief agreements with various jurisdictions. And the one with Spain was signed in 2011. So if you were in both places and have income from both places, so you may not be charged with this double tax under such relief. That's my presentation, and thank you. And I will hand it over to Heidi now. Thank you, Neville. Um, Heidi? Hello. Thank you, Heidi. OK. Good afternoon and good morning. Buenos dias, friends and colleagues of the Madrid Bar and the Law Society of Hong Kong. I'm Heidi Choi, member of the International Legal Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong. It's a wonderful opportunity to get connected with you online to share on part two on this topic, doing business in Hong Kong. In this section, I'm going to share the general laws and rules on importation into Hong Kong. What are the key restrictions and duties? Second, I would like to share the major legislations on safety regulations of consumer goods. Finally, I will briefly touch on anti-competition laws. Due to the time constraint, I will only give a brief introduction as to the key concepts and important legislations you can't ignore if you or your clients want to do business in Hong Kong. Now let's look at the first part, importation into Hong Kong, restrictions and duties. Are there any restrictions on the importation of consumer goods and commercial goods? Generally, there are no restrictions on importing commercial goods and services. However, importing or exporting any prohibited or controlled item into or out of Hong Kong is governed by legislation. Prohibited articles are goods in respect of which the import, export, or transit thereof are prohibited or controlled under the Import and Export Ordinance, Cap 60, Laws of Hong Kong. 
but there are various examples of prohibited controlled items, which includes dangerous drugs, psychotropic substances, controlled chemicals, antibiotics. These are drugs. Arms, ammunition, fireworks, rough diamonds, animals, plants, endangered species, telecommunication equipment, game, meat, and poultry. So there are there is also a very special category of goods, namely strategic commodities. And these strategic commodities requires licenses issued by the Director General of the Trade and Industry Department to import and export out of Hong Kong. So what are these strategic commodities? Examples are industrial dual use goods, such as electronics, computers, telecommunications and information security goods, etc. So you may often um, come across situations where um, these there are high tech goods which might be used in strategic products. For instance, high tech chips for mobile phones, computers, rockets, or national defense use. So these are subject to import and export control. Applicants for import and export licenses have to make declarations of use and provide details of the end user. So this is an area you should watch out. What import duties apply to com com um, commercial goods? Hong Kong is a free port and there is no customs tariff on goods imported into Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government collects an excise duty on only four types of goods, irrespective of whether they are imported or manufactured locally. Tobacco, hydrocarbon oil, liquor, methyl alcohol. A first registration tax is also charged on motor vehicles when first registered. Pausing here, um, I thought you would also be interested to learn about Sipper. The full name is Mainland and Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Agreement. Arrangement, what is that? Sipper is a free trade agreement signed between the mainland of China and Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Sipper enables a wide range of Hong Kong products complying with Sipper rules of origin to enjoy zero tariff treatment upon invitation into the mainland if covered by certificates of Hong Kong origin Sipper. Sipper is nationality neutral. It means that it allows overseas entities incorporated in Hong Kong to use Sipper to enter the mainland market. So how can foreign investors benefit from Sipper? Sipper opens up big markets for Hong Kong goods and services. It also brings opportunities for foreign investors. Foreign investors are welcome to set up or just invest in businesses in Hong Kong and tap into the benefits granted by Sipper to tap into the huge mainland market. Sipper covers mainly three broad areas. Let me briefly introduce them to you to show how foreign investors can benefit. The first area is trade in goods. All goods that are made in Hong Kong are able to be imported into the mainland with zero tariff. The manufacturer can apply for a certificate to certify the rules of origin to ensure everything is made in Hong Kong. Foreign investors are welcome to use Hong Kong as production base so that any product they make adhere to the rules of origin and can be transported to the mainland without any tariff. The second area is trade in services. The service suppliers of Hong Kong will enjoy special treatment when entering the mainland market in several surface areas. The professional bodies and regulatory authorities of the mainland have also signed several agreements and arrangements on recognizing professional qualification. This means that the best way to enter the mainland market for a foreign investor is to set up a shop in Hong Kong or to deal with a supplier who is already here. The third area is trade and investment facilitation. Both the mainland and Hong Kong have agreed to improve the cooperation between trade and investment facilitation areas to further improve general business environment. With Sipper, Hong Kong enjoys a favorable position with the mainland market by the most favored treatment provision. This provision protects Hong Kong such that if the mainland offers any kind of preferential treatment to another market, they must also offer it to the Hong Kong market. 
even if that prefer preferential treatment is better than something already offered by CIPR. So for this very reason, if foreign companies look to enter the mainland China market, they should consider setting up a Hong Kong company as a springboard. My colleague Nafo has already showcased the various forms of business associations in Hong Kong. So do watch out this space. Next, on part two, I'm going to generally introduce the safety regulations of consumer goods. What are the key safety regulations of consumer goods in Hong Kong? The key legislations are the Trade Descriptions Ordinance and the Consumer Goods Safety Ordinance. Trade Descriptions Ordinance is a piece of legislation which deals with prohibition against um, regarding false de trade descriptions and other unfair trade practices. Consumer Goods Safety Ordinance is the main piece of legislation dealing with product safety requirements. All consumer goods must comply with the general safety requirements or the safety standards and specifications prescribed by the Sec Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development of Hong Kong. Manufacturers, importers and suppliers, they have a duty to ensure that the consumer goods they supply are reasonably safe, including in the way the goods are presented, promoted and marketed, the use of any mark and instructions or warnings they give for keeping, using or consuming the goods. Manufacturers, importers, and suppliers must also adhere to the safety standards published by standards institutes or similar bodies for consumer goods when describing the goods for matters relating to such goods. Any reasonable um, means to make the goods safer should be considered and implemented. A due diligence defense also exists under, uh, under the ordinance. And any person who sells unsafe goods commits an offense is liable for, to fine and imprisonment on conviction. And also there are two other legislations which offer protection to consumers as contracting parties, which is the sale of goods ordinance. Sale of goods contracts are mainly governed by this ordinance. Safety and suitability requirements of goods are often considered implied terms in the sale of contracts, while certain implied terms or conditions and warranties are governed by this ordinance. There is also the control of sanction clauses ordinance. This ordinance governs civil liability. It governs any terms in the contract that seek to avoid liability for breach of contract, negligence, or other types of breaches of duty. Now, pausing here, I would like to mention briefly that we expect that CISG will be implemented in Hong Kong around the third quarter of this year by the Sale of Goods United Nations Convention Ordinance, CAPS 641. I'm sure that those of you in Spain, um, you might be quite familiar with the CISG. The CISG applies to generally commercial sales of goods and it will not generally apply to consumer sales. The CISG applies automatically to contracts for sale of goods between parties whose places of business are in different contracting states. The CISG allows parties to opt out of the convention by agreement, so there is party autonomy. And on this very brief note, let's stay tuned for the latest developments around the third quarter of this year. Now I'm coming to anti-competition law. Due to um, the complexity of anti-competition law and the constraints of time, I think that I'm going to be very brief to generally introduce uh, generally our um, anti-competition regime in Hong Kong. What is, anti what is competition law? There are generally three key competition rules under the competition ordinance, CAP 619, known as the first conduct rule, second conduct rule, and the merger rule. The competition rules apply to all entities engaged in economic activity, including companies, partnerships, sole traders, and trade associations, collectively referred to in the ordinance as undertakings. What is first conduct rule? The first conduct rule prohibits agreements and arrangements between undertakings that have the object or effect of preventing, restricting, or distorting competition in Hong Kong. The rule is particularly concerned with preventing cartel conduct, which is very, taken very seriously by the, by the uh, Competition Commission, 
which occurs when competitors agree to do one or more of the following activities. Bid rigging. What is bid rigging? It is agreeing strategy when bidding for or considering whether or not to bid for projects or when responding to invitations to tender. Market sharing, that is allocating sales, territories, customers or markets for the production or supply of goods or services. Output limitation, which means fixing, maintaining, controlling, preventing, limiting or eliminating the production or supply of goods or services. Price fixing, which means fixing, maintaining, increasing, or controlling the price for the supply of goods or services. What is second conduct rule? The second conduct rule prohibits undertakings that have a substantial degree of market power in the market from abusing that power. And abuse will occur when the undertaking engages in conduct that has the object or effect of preventing restricting or distorting competition in Hong Kong. Examples of conduct that might um, amount to an abuse of market power include exclusive dealing. It occurs when a supplier requires a customer to exclusively or largely acquire a good or service from the supplier or incentivizes a customer to do so. Predatory pricing. It occurs when a business sets the price of its goods or services so low that it is deliberately foregoing profits in order to force a competitor out of the market or to discipline the competitor. Refusal to deal. It occurs when a business with substantial market power refuses to supply a product or service or refuses to supply or, or refuses to supply the goods or service on reasonable terms. Tying and bundling. Tying occurs when a supplier makes a sale of one product conditional on the purchase on a different product. Bundling occurs when two products are, discount, are discounted if they are purchased together. There is also the merger rule. The merger rule prohibits mergers that have or are likely to have the effect of substantially lessening competition in Hong Kong. The rule only applies when one or more of the parties participating in the merger holds a carrier license within the meaning of the telecommunications uh, ordinance. I'm coming to exemptions and exclusions. Now, the first conduct rule does not apply to agreements that enhance overall economic efficiency. So these are agreements that contribute to improving production or distribution or promote technical or economic progress and meet several other criteria. The first conduct rule is also excluded if the combined turnover of the parties to a relevant agreement does not exceed 200 million Hong Kong dollars. However, the exclusion does not apply to agreements involving cartel conduct. The second co conduct rule does not apply to conduct by an ent entity that has an annual turnover not exceeding 40 million Hong Kong dollars. What are the consequences for breaching competition rules? First of all, there are pecuniary penalties. The maximum pecuniary penalty for each contravention of the competition rules is 10% of the turnover of the undertaking concerned for each year in which the contravention occurred up to a maximum of three years. Even if a company in breach is a very small part of a conglomerate, the maximum fine will be by reference to the turnover of the whole group. So it is very serious. Individuals involved may also be fined. There are also others that the commission or the tribunal can order. The competition tribunal may make any order it considers appropriate against a person who has breached competition law, including disqualifying a person from acting as a director from up, for up to five years, restraining and prohibiting a person from engaging in contravening conduct and declaring an agreement to be void or voidable. A person who has suffered loss or damage as a result of any act that has been determined to be a contravention of a conduct rule may commence a follow-up action against that person who contravened the rule or who was involved in the contravention. So who enforces 
the law, the comp the, that is the Competition Commission. The Competition Commission is responsible for investigating and enforcing the competition rules. The Communications Authority has concurrent jurisdiction in respect of anti-competitive conduct of certain undertakings in the telecommunications and broadcasting sectors. The Competition Commission has investigate, investigation powers, enforcement powers, and it is noteworthy that it also has published the uh, enforcement policy. You will be interested to note that um, the, uh, the Competition um, Commission focuses its resources on two particular types of conduct. One is cartel conduct, and the other is exclusionary behavior. Under the policy of the, um, there is also the leniency policy. Under the leniency policy, the commissioner will agree not to commence proceedings for pecuniary penalty and other orders against the first member of a cartel that comes forward and cooperate. Early cooperation with the commission may receive a reduced penalty. Finally, let me briefly introduce the competition tribunal. The tribunal is responsible for hearing and determining cases brought under the ordinance. It has jurisdiction to hear competition cases, in, including applications by the commission, applications for review of commission decisions and private follow-up actions. If the tribunal finds that a person has contravened a competition rule, it may impose pecuniary penalties and make any other order. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share uh, with the brief introduction of doing business uh, in Hong Kong today. As you may note, there are huge opportunities for Spanish investors who are interested in doing business in Hong Kong. We do welcome exchanges with our colleagues in Madrid on how we can tap on the opportunities in doing business in Hong Kong and Spain. And I do look forward to meeting you in Hong Kong or in Spain very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi, and thank you for, um, to Neville as well for giving us an overview about doing business in Hong Kong. So now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Um, I would like to invite our audience to submit any questions you may have via the Zoom chat box, and our speakers would be most happy to answer them. Um, to start with, I myself have a question for um, Oha and Juan Martin, which I'm sure is of interest to many of our participants in Hong Kong. Um, what, what's the stance of Spanish authorities towards Hong Kong and KRC mainland investments in Spain? And um, what do you see in your practice as the main challenges to Hong Kong and KRC mainland investments in Spain? Um. Yeah, Borja, I don't know if you want to go or... Yes, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, well, I would say that uh, first point, the stance is generally welcoming, as I said in, in, in my presentation. Uh, there are, have been investments of uh, PSC companies, mainland PSC companies and Hong Kong companies in almost all the sectors from uh, ports, banks, uh, uh, logistics, uh, 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 food, beverage, uh, uh, and, and energy. Uh, very recently, Free Gorges, for example, uh, which is an SOE, as you know, acquired uh, uh, a big investment in, in the energy sector. That's the first point. The second point, uh, we cannot deny that the general stance uh, towards investments generally in the world is, is uh, uh, veering into protectionism uh, and, and uh, uh, regulations as the FDI uh, U European regulation are being enacted. Uh, the third point I, I think is fair to make is although that regulations have resulted in more, a more cautious approach uh, mostly, I think, in the face of foreign investors that would not like to risk the embarrassment of, of their investment being rejected. Uh, I still uh, believe that in Spain and, and Portugal, uh, uh, the, the general stance uh, towards uh, uh, PSC investments is, 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 is welcoming. 
in, in terms of challenges, I think that that perception is a challenge to, for, for the flows. The second is culture, of course, it's not the same. And, and you may have experienced this in your own practice. Is, is, uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, when negotiating investments of this kind, we, we get lost in translation. Uh, uh, the different negotiation styles, uh, the different uh, uh, character of, uh, of, of uh, a Chinese or a Spanish counterpart. Uh, sometimes for, for us uh, practitioners to generate a, a challenge to get the message uh, through. And the third one is, uh, of course, the, the regulatory, the regulatory uh, roadblocks that may exist um, as the ones I think I, dis I described and, and are similar to the one that we just uh, heard from, from our, our uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, colleagues. But, uh, in, in antitrust, uh, both in, in antitrust and, and generally in FDI clearances, uh, as well as in license permits, as I explained in my presentation, the, 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 the sort of red tape uh, that exists in, in Spain and that we have been trying to reduce, uh, but it's still a problem. I mean, requires uh, patience and, 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 and a bit of, uh, good advice and, and, and guidance on, on, on the part of, of uh, legal advisors. Thanks, Juan Martin. Um, are there any industries which you see like a big green light, which are eager for investments? I guess, um, be it foreign investments or local investments, what are like the hot um, industries which um, the Spanish government authorities are trying to promote or attract investments? Yeah. Yeah, clearly uh, green energies, the new economy, there is a big European fund as a result of COVID that is called the Next Generation EU uh, Fund, which uh, Spain has benefited on almost 75 billion uh, euros and, and, and is meant to promote investments on those sectors, on, 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 on the new economy, digital economy, and also in, in, in the green environmental related sectors from from energy to, to I mean, energy generation, uh, uh, renewables, and also uh, uh, energy savings. Um, and, and, and those clearly are, are what we see as the main sectors where, uh, where foreign investors are investing and, and probably where uh, uh, mainland Chinese and Hong Kong uh, investors are, are more interested uh, as, as, as part of, of their own uh, challenges in, in China, the, the agenda, the green agenda in, in China is, 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 is very, very relevant. And, 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 and as a result, I guess that a, a number of companies and particularly so with companies as free gorgeous as I explained before that uh, 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 that are not, we are not uh, that much focused 10 years ago, perhaps in, in solar and, and wind energy are now uh, get into th those factors, no, not only in China, but also overseas. And Spain is is big, big market in that, on that regard. It's one of the leading uh, economies in terms of uh, um, the, the, the volume, the part of the mix in the energy uh, uh, generation that is crea created by, is generated by renewables and, and there are strong companies uh, and, and of course a, a lot of sun. So, so uh, a, a very fertile land uh, for that uh, kind of investment. Great, thank you, Juan Martin. Um, Boha, would you have anything else to add or should I move on to the next question? Well, well actually um, the comments from Juan Martin were perfect. I, I, would, and I fully agree with him uh, in the sectors, in the main challenges, the FDI and all. Uh, I wouldn't like to add anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I agree. These are all very useful insights. Thank you. So um, turning to Heidi and Neville, um, can you please share with us um, the stance of Hong Kong authorities towards um, Spanish investments? And what do you see as the main challenges to Spanish investments in Hong Kong and mainland China, please? Hello? Neville, would you want to take this? Yeah, I think I think all foreign investments are welcome to Hong Kong and 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 to China, and I agree I agree with Huang about the differences in culture. Well, actually, um, for mainland Chinese, 
their culture is, is quite different from the West in and in particular their style of doing business. Even for Hong Kong people first encounter them, we find it difficult to to do business with them because they're always um, thinking about making friends first before you do any business. So 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 one may have to adjust to that style and to understand them before before they you can develop the business relationship. And and I think I think it's advisable for for foreign investments or business businessmen coming to Hong Kong as as a stepping stone to enter China to find a reliable local partner for entering the PLC market. I think it, it would be much better. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. Um And um, going back to um, Borja and Juan Martin, um, Heidi previously um, gave us quite a detailed um, overview of um, Hong Kong's anti-competition legal landscape. Um, I'm wondering what's the antitrust landscape like in Spain? Is it um, a hot and developing area or is it quite developed already? What are the key things to watch out for investors? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, the antitrust landscape in Spain is 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 already very developed. You have to bear in mind that um, this is uh, regulated uh, or harmonized uh, at the European Union level. Uh, um, so uh, the antitrust landscape in the whole Europe it's it's quite sophisticated so far. Uh, obviously, they they are strengthening and and developing it in more detail but it is uh, quite developed right now. Uh, you have uh, uh, an, at uh, the EU level, you have uh, uh, the controls, the, 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 uh, well, the, the, the authorities controlling all, the, all these issues about antitrust, but also at local level, at a national level, each of the jurisdictions in the EU have their, their bodies also. Um, I could highlight that uh, um, it is quite important, for example, for the buyers. When, when it comes to M&A transaction, it is quite important for the buyers uh, when it uh, when when the, the volume of the transaction uh, exceeds some thresholds in the market. Uh, uh, it is quite important to to get clearance to, to first to assess if uh, clearance it, it is required, uh, and then if it is required, uh, obviously to submit a, a formal uh, a formal for a formal approval by the authorities. It is quite critical. It is uh, uh, something which is uh, very important to bear in mind because, uh, um, well, in the worst case scenario, the, the transaction may be considered as null, but uh, this is quite um, extreme, uh, but uh, obviously there could be fines and it is, it is something quite, uh, quite important to watch. And, and also it applies to other, other not only for m a but also for anti-competitive practices. Uh, so when, when uh, that would be uh, also another, another recommendation when it comes to uh, agreements, commercial agreements uh, related, which may imply, uh, imply um, well, in a way, restriction of the prices, uh, exclusivities, uh, uh, non-competition provisions, and so on. Uh, Sometimes it is forgotten, uh, the antitrust, uh, but it is quite important uh, because of the fines uh, are high uh, and, and the authorities are, are well, kind of checking these this kind of transactions. Great. Thanks for the great tips, um, Boha. And um, finally, um, um, Boha and Juan Martin mentioned about um, renewable um, energy industries as the hot um, industry to watch in Spain. Um, can Heidi or Neville, maybe Heidi could take this. Um, what, is, um, what would you think is the hot industry or hot trend right now in Hong Kong, which you would like to share with um, our Spanish friends here? Thank you, Alison. Uh, I do think that it's very, uh, ESG is an extremely hot topic. Uh, green finance is uh, and and um, the control of carbon emission. We have do have a car, target to meet, so uh, we do expect that uh, there are a lot of investment or, um, or fundraising activities relating to green energy and renewable energy. 
So to encourage uh, the ESG, the corporate governance, and also social re corporate responsibilities that we have to um, maintain the sustainability business structure and uh, culture so that um, we have to aim for the future for the humankind. So um, we will see that uh, there are a lot of government initiatives, including the Hong Kong uh, Monetary Authority taking the lead to encourage businesses and also listed companies that they have to um, look at their ESG policies in their annual uh, submissions to ensure that they are in line, they have incorporated ESG elements into their uh, corporate strategies. So these are the areas that I, I think that um, we can't miss out. And um, also um, on the FinTech area, and I think that uh, that is something that is also brimming in Hong Kong. And also, um, there are also um, financial services uh, that we have to watch out. I'm sure that Neville can supplement on the Wealth Connect. The Wealth Connect is actually connecting um, investments um, to into and out of Hong Kong between the mainland and Hong Kong. So um, individual investors, they can have a, they can directly invest into stocks and shares in the Hong Kong um, companies and listed in Hong Kong. So they, um, that will facilitate trade and, and they will also facilitate capital movements and also the booming of the financial market. Neville, do you have anything to add? So you're right, I think, um... What we're usually talking about now is a hot topic is the so-called family office by, by the many entrepreneurs. Because um, they get rich and get lots of wealth and assets. They want to know how to protect them as it would pass down the generations and, and inflation is, is so terrible then. They would always thinking about how they can, they can put their money anywhere in the world and to save back to value. So it's a very hot topic. and, and but many lawyers and accountants are thinking about the way to serve their clients is a very, very hot topic. So I think it, it would be some cross broader matters than, than uh, lawyers from different jurisdictions may work together for serve our clients on this area. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Heidi and Neville. Um, thank you to all our speakers for your great presentations and all the sharing. Um, personally, I think it is really encouraging to hear that renewable energy and ESG are under the spotlight, both in um, Hong Kong and Spain. Um, and we do hope that our presentation and discussions have helped um, our audience to better understand and grasp the exciting opportunities in both markets. Um, now we would like to move on to the closing remarks, um, which will be delivered by Maria, board member of the Madrid Bar Association, and Amarali, vice president of the Law Society of Hong Kong and chairman of the International Legal Affairs Committee. May I please um, first hand to Maria? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you. Um, I would like to begin these closing remarks by thanking the President of the Law Society of Hong Kong and the President of the Madrid Bar Association for opening this webinar and for sharing their initial thoughts. It has been a privilege to hear from both. I would also like to congratulate our distinguished speakers for their excellent performance and for their fruitful exchange of ideas and uh, and uh, knowledge. I can firmly say that we have all learned from their insights. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants in this webinar that have joined us uh, throughout uh, the almost two hours that we've been, we've been uh, sharing our thoughts. I have been told that at some point there were more than 130 people from Spain and Hong Kong connected. Thank you very much to all of you for making this, this webinar possible. As deputy of the Madrid Bar Association's government body in charge of the international relationships, it has been an honor for me and for this institution to participate and co-organize this joint webinar um, doing business in Hong Kong and Spain. I'm confident that we have all gained useful uh, knowledge and have a better understanding now of how uh, of the latest developments in setting up and doing business in Hong Kong and Spain works. There is no doubt that every day transborder activity, commercial exchange, investments, and partnerships between our 
uh, our two jurisdictions are becoming stronger and more diverse than ever. The visits of the Hong Kong Trade Development to Madrid and the Spanish Institute for Foreign Exchange, the ISEX, to Hong Kong in the last couple of years reflect that Hong Kong and Spain have increasingly become important economic partners, as the Madrid Bar President earlier mentioned. There is no doubt that the understanding that understanding the legal ecosystem ecosystem in essential for is essential for companies when they enter markets which have not been explored in the past or have or have been poorly explored. As we surely all agree, events like this one, which help to connect legal and business professionals, are even more important now. With a world that is recovering from a global pandemic which has dramatically disrupted the health, financial welfare, social order, and political stability of all nations. And ours are not an exception. I strongly believe that bar associations have the duty to accompany legal practitioners with this continuing sharing of legal knowledge so that we can also share this <clears throat> with our clients by stimulating the connection within practitioners of our jurisdictions, we will be able to keep facilitating business and clients to extend these economic relations, which will benefit our both uh, nations. For these reasons, the Madrid Bar Association will always support forums, webinars, and round tables of close allies, such as the Law Society of Hong Kong proves to be. Madrid Bar Association has always taken interest in participating in the Law Society's President's Roundtables. Today, we reaffirm our interest in joining and co-organizing future events. The Madrid Bar Association and the Law Society of Hong Kong relationship can go and will go on beyond this. Thank you very much and congratulations to all. Thank you, Maria. Um, may I, we have um, a Morali now? please. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Buenos dias, everyone. <clears throat> I'm pleased to um, see that the seminar has been uh, conducted <clears throat> very efficiently. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. C.M. Chan, President of Law Society of Hong Kong, Mr. Jose Marie Alonso Puig, Dean of Madrid Bar Association, also Borja, and Juan, who have spoken and given us details of Spain, as well as Neville Chang, uh, Heidi and Alison uh, for participating. Finally, Maria, Sigimon, um, and of course the translators. <clears throat> I was actually <clears throat> in Spain in 2019, three times, and I visited the Madrid Bar Association and at that time discussed possibilities of uh, webinars and other connections with Latin America. And very glad to hear that this has now come to fruition. One thing I found when I was in Spain was that uh, Chinese companies and uh, Spanish companies when negotiating contracts, some of them actually chose Hong Kong as a um, as the law of Hong Kong as part of the contract for, for arbitrations and that was very interesting. And one other thing I found, I know you've mentioned cultural differences, but there is one cultural similarity which divides which actually consolidates those differences and that's food. The love of food of Spanish people and the love of food of Hong Kong is I think the binding force of culture and with that I'd like to bid you all a good evening and um, a good lunch or a good dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amarali. Um, thank you all once again for joining us today. Um, we hope that you all have some good um, takeaways from our webinar, and we look forward to seeing and building more collaboration and partnerships um, between Spain and Hong Kong going forward. Um, adios, goodbye. <laughs>